Zia Olhak is um, a pretty hardcore military dictator. Much of the Islamization that you see um, that's become problematic in Pakistan today is due to policies that were introduced to during his time. For example, he um, forced people to study Islam in the schools. He changed the educational curriculum. He Islamized the military. That used to be a very secular institution. That's no longer the case. Um, but he also did some good things. During his time in power, the economy grew by 7%, where it was barely growing before. Um, and importantly, and we'll come to this when we go to the discussion session, he um, forged an alliance of convenience with the United States. Because what happened in the late 1970s in Afghanistan? Soviet invasion, exactly. And you probably heard about this from Eikenberry last week. But over the course of that decade from the Soviet invasion, it really starts in the early 1980s when Reagan comes to power in the US. The US gives $10 billion in aid to the Mujahideen to fight um, the Soviets in what's, again, what's the tribal areas. And our US policy is focused on, at first, needling the Soviets without really putting our stamp on it. And then later, when that's very successful, it becomes more ambitious. And it becomes, why can't we oust the Soviets from Afghanistan? That policy, if that's what it was, was very successful. In the late 1980s, the Soviets withdraw. However, what we didn't consider with those policies, and this is what we'll discuss at the end of the class, is how this affects the actual um, situation on the ground in Afghanistan and Pakistan. When we aided the Mujahideen, we did very little, we did some, but we did very little um, of our own vetting of which forces were going to get the aid. Mostly we left that to the Pakistani spy service, the ISI. Um, the Saudis said, we'll double whatever the Americans give. So the Saudis are also enormously involved in this conflict. Sounds a little bit like Syria today. <laughs> and um, the Saudis give much of their aid to what we would now consider the worst of the worst. Um, the ISI supports some people that we could, would consider armed terrorists. It supported others that were not quite so bad. But overall, it's, it's a... It's a legacy that left problems that I think nobody anticipated in the 1980s. Then, because our policy has succeeded, because the Soviets have pulled out, we also pull out the region. Um, there are almost no aid budgets for Afghanistan or Pakistan in the 1990s. Um, the US and Europe don't really pay attention when Afghanistan descends into a, an unbelievably brutal civil war, which is ended only when the Taliban comes to power. And Pakistan kind of flounders along. Zia ul Haq, the dictator, is killed in a plane crash in 1988. And then you have a series of democratic governments, um, one of them run by Benazir Bhutto, Zulfi Bhutto's daughter, and another one run by Nawaz Sharif, who's also the current leader of Pakistan. And they kind of trade off. Lots of infighting between the two democratic parties, not a lot getting done, economic stagnation, not a great relationship with the United States. 1999, you guessed it, another military coup. Um, Musharraf comes to power. And at first, the US isn't paying a whole lot of attention to him or to the region. And then, of course, 9-11 happens, September 11th. 2001, and suddenly this region of the world explodes onto center stage in a way that no one really would have imagined. Um, the US immediately goes to Musharraf and says, you're either with us or you're against us, and if you're with us, we'll pay you handsomely for it. And there are essentially three things that the US needs from Pakistan at this time. We need Pakistan to be the conduit for supply lines for our troops that are going into Afghanistan. So as you know, Afghanistan is landlocked. The closest port is Karachi, the closest major port. And so most of the supplies, even now, that go to our troops in Afghanistan, as many, some of you, I see some um, veterans here, um, are basically trucked through Pakistan into Afghanistan. That's by far the cheapest route. 
we'll get to this. In 2011, Pakistan at some point shuts down those supply lines, and we made it work for about nine months without Pakistan, but it was enormously expensive. So that's one thing we need. And we got it, pretty much, for 10 years. That's successful. Two, the US essentially paid the Pakistani army to keep soldiers in the tribal areas of Pakistan. And the understanding was that the Pakistanis, as a sovereign nation, would capture any Al-Qaeda or Taliban that were escaping from Afghanistan and either kill them or arrest them. That policy was not such a success. <laughs> there are lots of stories of Pakistanis turning the other way. It is very well known that the Afghan Taliban basically has its government in exile in Quetta, which you see right there is the capital of Balochistan. Um, so that part of the policy, not a success, even though we're paying lots of money for it. And finally, we need them for intelligence cooperation, and we need them to help us capture al-Qaeda operatives and um, Taliban. That part is actually, you always hear in the news today about what a failure that's been. I would call that, the outcome of that policy, more mixed. We actually did get some decent intelligence cooperation from the Pakistanis, but then there's others, you know, notable failures, like Osama bin Laden is living comfortably in a in a small town that I actually used to live in when I was growing up, and nobody seemed to know. So notable failures there as well. 